traffic has pretty much taken for granted by most of us. It is part of our everyday lives. Yet to the people of Moose Factory and Moose and e, it is an all-important link to the outside. There are no roads connecting these communities to the south. In the 60-odd years since the Iron Horse reached the mouth of the Moose River and James Bay, it has had its impact on society. That society has changed dramatically in some aspects. And yet it has still clung to the stabilizing forces of traditional ways. In this program, we are offered a poignant and insightful glimpse through the eyes of a mother and daughter into the makeup and the underpinnings of the majority Cree population. A mother and daughter who find their home between two worlds. Meet George Jolly. I make my living for, for the summer riding the boat, water taxiing back and forth in the river. That's where I'm earning my living. And in winter, in the winter time, I go in the bush trapping, trapping animals. That's what I do. Hunting, fishing, trapping, part of inherited custom, integrated into modern day society here at Moose Factory on Moose Factory Island. With its history tied to the Hudson Bay Company, this is the oldest permanent English-speaking settlement in the province of Ontario. A resident of this community of 1800, George Jolly, like his neighbors, follows seasonal activities that fill practical needs while tasting the pleasure of accomplishment. <laughs> Mark's here on Ice and Cardiac, I have. She, she, duck. The majority of the population here are descendants of the Muskegog, Swampy Cree, whose inhabitation of the James and Hudson Bay lowlands dates back to the retreat of the glaciers some nine or 10,000 years ago. The bond to the natural environment remains unshakable despite the influences of modernization. Moose Factory Island is in the delta of the Moose River, part of the coastal plain of the Hudson Bay Lowlands, one of the largest wetlands in the world. Located on the nearby mainland is the community of Moose and e. Of approximately the same population as its neighbor, it is the center of rail, water, and air services for the region. Since the first aircraft landed here in 1920, transportation has been a key influence, presiding over change. In many ways, life here resembles that of the South, yet with a distinctive personality shaped by isolation. The bordering communities are the largest settlements in the province without access to the provincial highway system. Vehicles brought in by train service individual needs, accessing a local street network. A marriage of the Missinabe, Metagami, and Abitibi rivers, the main street common to both places, is the Moose River. Originating about 560 kilometers to the south, here it merges with saltwater tides of two to four meters. Access to Hudson Bay as an alternative to the St. Lawrence was the political motivation to bring the railway to these shores.
At the start of this century, it was the Temiskaming and Northern Ontario Railroad. Today, it's Ontario Northland's Polar Bear Express, at the end of its four and a half hour run from home base in Cochrane. The daily summer excursion train is a recreation for many, but for Emily Ferries, the bear is a way of being connected. I was uh, born and raised here in the community of Moose Factory. I left here and I was sent to Southern Ontario to go to high school and then um, uh, I stayed down there. I went on to university and uh, then to uh, teacher training. So I uh, have my roots here and uh, uh, I always try to uh, come home as much as I can. Fascination for the region extends to international audiences, curious to experience the place that Emily is a part of. In the era following World War II, the train gave impetus to tourism. This, along with transportation and government services, is today a vital industry, an economic mainstay. Artists, like Leo Etherington, work at interpreting ancestral themes. The first written accounts describing the people of the region were by explorer Henry Hudson in 1610. Descriptions reveal the Cree population as a semi-nomadic society whose existence was governed by spirituality. Moving between seasonal hunting and fishing grounds, wildfowl was their staple diet, the taking of it sacred. They believed that all things living were to be shared in trust, respecting future generations. Perhaps a renewed understanding of history is timely. John Long, who came here as a school teacher, has studied the past, comparing interpretations. If I had it to do over again, I would have started with the oral tradition, and I would have uh, tape recorded as many people as possible. There are people who have died in the last 10 or 20 years, because uh, I'm convinced that that oral tradition has an integrity of its own. Moosonee began in the early 1900s, over two centuries after the birth of Moose Factory. Ravio Frères, a fur company based in Paris, France, established a base here, forging headlong into competition with the entrenched Hudson Bay Company. Ravio succumbed within a few years. Its buildings along the river and a newly laid out main street were the extent of Moosonee when this picture was taken on July 15, 1931. That was the day the last leg of steel was tied to the shores of the Moose. No longer dependent on yearly supply ships or canoe and portage routes to the south, the shift was felt overnight. Suddenly, goods can be brought in uh, by rail uh, through Montreal rather than uh, brought in by ship through Hudson Bay and James Bay. History, culture, economics, tie Moosonee and Moose Factory to a number of communities that dot the coastline of James Bay. Places like Fort Albany, Attawapiska, and Winisk depend on barges pulled by tugs. A link to the railway, it is the most effective way for the shipment of heavy goods in the short summer season. Barges are replaced by tractor trains that cover the distances over frozen muskeg in winter months. Loading and unloading similar to this is repeated at every stop. The forces of nature, tides, and ice in the bay make dock construction prohibitive. Bound up in the geography of this subarctic region is a way of life exemplified in the story of Emily Ferry's family. We come from uh, uh, the whole area of James Bay. And uh, I think the reason why uh, we settled here is because it was uh, more central and uh, the school was here and uh, uh, my father was able to get employment here. And I think that in, in this community, uh, the people are closer in the way where uh, people have very large families and their uh, people still follow uh, the tradition of extended families. 
uh, families still get together and some families like are a hundred and all or like even up to 200 and they're all related. Regular visits home contribute to a balancing of past and present. The values and traditional skills that Emily draws on are also a link her mother B has strived to maintain. I must be seated this morning. I was about 12 years old when I was first taught to, how to make a moccasins. Oh. Mm -hmm. Uh, I made a shoes for a little baby. This lady said, make shoes for my little baby, and then that's when I first started. So I kept on going and even learning to clean hides and everything. Watch my mother do everything. I learned it mostly from my mother. The bird that makes it. Now with a doctorate in education, her work taking her far afield, Emily keeps her sense of belonging through this contact. It just feels so good to be able to just walk on the earth. And I find that with the native culture, um, all of creation in the natural environment is, uh, is one with us. Uh, we're part of that. And uh, it is our, our responsibility to make sure that uh, creation is taken care of. And we were put here to, with that responsibility. Tourism provides a social interaction in the area of James, 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 James Bay as patterns. With the arrival of Europeans, the Cree traded less with native bands to the south. They took up commerce and more permanent settlement, a home guard around fur company outposts. As generations before them, Janie and Alec Lutet prepare hides for making moccasins and other items. Trade was central in the reciprocal connection that brought Europeans into contact with Aboriginal peoples. But the exchange was more far-reaching. Hudson Bay men, many originating from Scotland's Orkney Islands, were introduced to the snowshoe, the toboggan, and food like pemmican, First Nation people adapted the Scots biscuit-like bread. It's sold today in, uh, in uh, breads, bread shops, in uh, bakeries, in uh, Stromness and the Orkney Islands as well. It's very different. It's very refined and very light. It's very different from the, the bannock that we get here, which is probably the same kind of bannock that, uh, that the Scots people brought over. I prefer it to the, the, the bannock that we tasted over in Stromness. The most effective means of transportation in the opening up of Canada was adopted from native society, the canoe. The Rupert House, or freighter canoe, which became the workhorse of the North, is tied to Northern history and remains all important. Monroe Linkletter, an elder of Moose Factory, services the needs of the region. Well, I'm from the Bay Area, born in a Baldwin River. Father being an employee with a then French company, Ravion Furs. Being, you know, in, on the Moose River system here, we use them very extensively. As a person in the city uses a car. The original hunting decoy. A scaled down version has become a keepsake, popular with visitors. Made of the branches of the tamarack tree, indigenous to the region, crafting tamarack geese is also part of George Jolly's livelihood. What is that? See it? Caught in eyes, how? Dig it with it. Look, to my scale, crooked, angle. 
St. Thomas Church originated in an era when the Hudson Bay Company governed over Rupert's Land, a territory covering four-tenths of present-day Canada. At one time, Rupert's Land was suggested as an English Siberia for convicts, but its wealth of furs made it the envy of both England and France. 1673 is when uh, the first establishment was built at Moose Factory by non-native people. Uh, the old forts had palisades or walls built around them, largely to protect the English from the French. Not really to de for defense against the Indians. There were very, very few uh, incidents of any kind of hostility between Indians and, uh, and non-Indians. Fred Moore is another community elder who has lived the transition. A former Hudson Bay Company employee, Moore worked the coastal barges. His experience was part of a time when non-native influence was pervasive. Education and religion were part of this way. The first denomination to set up a mission church, the Wesleyans, contributed to the social impression from 1840 on. This is Christ the King Cathedral in Moussigny. The, uh, the Indians had their own notions of power, uh, religious power, so it was very easy for them to, uh, to draw parallels with the uh, um, Christian missionaries. They also had uh, belief in a superior being who they called Manitou, and so it was very, very easy for them to uh, reconcile that with the Christian notions of a, um, a supreme being. The religious influence penetrated every level of society. Um, there was an Indian and his wife by the name of um, Robin Wetham, which, uh, which translates into English as something like morning cry. And his wife, who is listed in the record as uh, Squishish, which just means woman. And they're baptized as John Wesley and Susanna Wesley. And that's still a very common uh, name here today. A Wesleyan minister, James Evans, devised a system of syllabics based on shorthand, enabling the Cree to read and write in their own dialect. It's probably a more perfect system of writing than English because it's based on sounds. In English, we have all these different letters that stand for different sounds depending on what word they're used in. And uh, the, the big strength of the syllabic system was that someone could learn it in uh, two weeks. In 1673, Governor Charles Bailey, one of the first permanent resident non-natives, brought a violin with him to, as he put it, relieve the cold days and long winter nights in a desolate part of the world. The tradition is carried on by performers like Sinclair Chichu. The fiddlers of James Bay play many Scottish traditional tunes inherited from their trading partners. The region has experienced three and a half centuries of interchange between value systems. The merging of cultures is in evidence everywhere in the modern day, yet a distinctiveness remains. It was trade, exchanges between peoples, that gave rise to an interdependence. This reliance of one on another remains in part within an integrated economy and in broader terms within society itself. With this as a term of reference, as Emily and her mother look to the future, the focus is on a balance. Like a lot of Native people would just like to be able to go back and live the way it was uh, before uh, European contact. But because we all know that's not possible, uh, I think that uh, Native people will gradually uh, learn to live in the balance of the two worlds. Mm -hmm. It was important for my people to keep their culture, especially with the things they can make with their own hands. So that's why I got this idea that came to my mind one time that I, we should have a craft shop 
where we can buy their, their crafts and, uh, and teach young kids to do it too. Reaching into the fiber of Moose Factory and Moosinee are the customs and spirituality that anchor it to the land. This is a Canada goose, and I cooked it by the open fire. This is the old traditional way of cooking it. And uh, like when we have special occasions, we cook meals like this. Anything that we get from the, from the land is our traditional food. Sometimes we eat it with, with uh, potatoes or corn. And it's cheap. Yeah. 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 The prayer is like uh, we say, thank you, great Father in heaven, who give us the food. The family bond that draws Emily home is made of the components of worlds separate. The influences that have come this way have at the same time been the force that has bound a culture to its values. It is said, our destiny is not a place. It is the true and lasting good of humankind in this region. <laughs>